Hi everybody, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today for our very first People Lab Playlist webinar. My name's Emma Bridger and I'm Director at People Lab and I'm going to be talking to you about our rough guide to employee engagement for the next half an hour or so. We're going to be looking at what employee engagement is, what are the different definitions that are out there, and we're going to take a little bit of look at the little look at the evidence as well. Does it actually matter? Does engagement drive performance? And then we're going to talk about how you actually do it. So how do you actually improve engagement in organisations? During the webinar, you'll see you're able to ask questions. So please do ping your questions over to us and we'll do our best to answer them. OK, so let's begin. What is employee engagement? Unfortunately, there's no universal agreed definition of employee engagement. Uh, David McLeod and Nita Clark, in their Engage for Success report to government a few years ago, found some 50 plus different definitions and counting. It doesn't make our job any easier, really. I'm going to share with you a few definitions on the next slide, just to get you thinking about this. So, some people talk about employee engagement in terms of organisational citizenship, and that really is just commitment. Uh, to the organisation and its values, plus a willingness to help out. Employee engagement is definitely more than job satisfaction. We all know it's about going the extra mile, and it's not just about motivation. One of the key points to make is that engagement is something that employees have to offer up. They have to choose to volunteer themselves to be engaged. We can't require it as part of their contract. We can't put it in their objectives and demand that they'll be engaged by the end of Q2. 2013. The definition that I use is the extent to which people feel personally involved in the success of a business. So for me really it's about people caring, it's about them wanting to go the extra mile. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to come into work every day going yay I'm so happy I love my job. There'll be days when it's hard, it's tough but because they are involved in the success of the business they feel there's a personal involvement there, they really care about their job. Sometimes it's actually easier to think about what engagement isn't. What does disengagement look like? If you look on the next slide, I've taken that uh, shot there from the infamous Computer Says No sketch from Little Britain. We all know disengagement when we see it, and there's no business out there that would, uh, would want disengaged employees. So 60-odd different definitions of employee engagement no universal agreed definition. Um, academics talk about work engagement, practitioners talk about employee engagement, and still the debate range, rages on by what we mean by engagement. I actually think it's more useful in some ways to just park that for a minute and think about approaches to engagement. Coming back to the David McLeod and Nita Clark Engage for Success report to government a few years ago, they made this distinction between transactional and transformational engagement. And I actually think that's probably more helpful when we talk about engagement in organisations to really think about which level we're operating on. So what do we mean by transactional and transformational engagement? Well, transactional engagement is the kind of engagement where we often feed back from a survey. So we run a survey, the survey gives us some data and insight we look at what the data is telling us, we often take the bottom three things from the survey, we action plan around them, we try and fix them, um, there's a set of activities and targets. Um, it's quite a reactive approach to engagement, so we're kind of doing, doing, survey, uh, doing a survey, saying what, you know, what's not working, and then we react to that. So we're not proactively trying to find out what's going to engage our people. It's very much an uh, add-on, a separate activity. Um, so quite often what you tend to find is that once the uh, action plan has been implemented, engagement gets kind of shelved until the survey happens the next year. It's definitely not integral to the business. And it's really kind of, I suppose, summed up by feeling like a set of trans transactions or essentially a tick in the box. So what do we mean by transformational engagement? Well, transformational engagement is just a way of doing business. Uh, employees are absolutely integral to um, the organisation and, and the way they feel is integral to the organisation's success. 
is very much proactive. We don't wait until the survey once a year to tell us how people are feeling and what's going to engage them. We seek insight regularly and we harness that insight and act upon it regularly. Um, and it's very much integrated into the business strategy. Um, in the Engage for Success report, David and Nita very much talk about this as level one and level two engagement. In my experience, I've seen this more as a kind of a scale. So um, starting at the far left is transactional engagement. And then lots of organisations that I've worked with and worked for over the years make this journey towards transformation, transformational engagement. So have a think about where you might sit on that scale are you very much in the transactional uh, engagement approach? Are you moving towards a transformational approach? Or have you cracked transformational engagement? And I just wanted to sum this up with a quote from David McLeod. Uh, employee engagement is the difference that makes the difference and could make all of the difference. I think that's a really neat quote just to, uh, to bring that together. So I guess um, in terms of what is engagement, if you're looking for a definition... Um, I'd say take a look at the Engage for Success report. It's a free PDF you can download. Um, or have a look at the Engage for Success website. Um, there's some really, really great resources on there. I guess the point I'd make is that it doesn't really matter so long as within your own organisation you're all on the same page. So you're all talking about the same thing uh, when you talk about employee engagement. And actually it's a really useful exercise to figure out what engagement means to you and what definition you're going to use. Some really interesting conversations will come out of that. Okay, so we're going to look at what can employee engagement achieve. So um, over the years, there's been a lot of debate around, um, you know, the link to the bottom line. Does engagement really drive um, business outcomes? And the answer is absolutely yes, 100% yes. So in terms of um, just pulling out some key nuggets for you from the research, I wanted to start with perhaps one of the most infamous pieces uh, of research on employee engagement. And this comes from the Sears employee customer profit chain. And this was the first time a piece of research had really made the link between how people feel and um, business performance. It was published in the Harvard Business Review in uh, the late 90s and essentially looked at um, the Sears, the, the retailer in, in the US. And um, the, the research found that a five-point increase in employee attitude correlated positively with a 1.3 increase in customer satisfaction, which then correlated with a 0.5 increase in revenue growth. So when this piece of research was first published, um, Lots of, of people out there, uh, like myself and like many of you, got quite excited about the fact that for the first time we could demonstrate with evidence a link between how people feel um, and um, the bottom line of the business. Um, I thought it was worth just focusing on this because actually it's a piece of research that I still use today. Uh, it's still a very, very compelling piece of research and essentially one that makes senior people sit up and take notice of employee engagement. So quite useful, I think, to revisit that. Now, I mentioned Engage for Success before. Um, earlier this year, Engage for Success published a fantastic piece of research, um, or sorry, a fantastic re uh, report called Nailing the Evidence. Um, that very colourful uh, PDF there, you'll see the infographic, is, I guess, the summary of the report that, that um, was, was led by um, some of the guys on the Engage for Success uh, Workforce Task Force. Um, it's all free, so go and have a look at it. Download the Nailing the Evidence report, download the, the PDF and stick it up on the walls to remind everybody that 100% um, employee engagement absolutely impacts um, performance, bottom line. Um, whether you're looking at innovation, whether you're looking at profit, whether you look at productivity, revenue growth, there is something in there for everyone. And depending on who you're trying to convince, um, I'm sure you'll be able to pull out some fantastic stats and figures and case studies to, to make, your, make your case. So I'm not going to go into that in any great detail now, but I'd urge you to have a look at the Engage with Success website and download the PDF um, that's free to download, that shows that infographic there, 
and have a look at the nailing the evidence report. But if all of that fails to convince your stakeholders, the other um, the other area that I, I get people to look at is uh, Glassdoor. I've put their ignore it at your peril. So Glassdoor, so the, the URL is www.glassdoor.com. Um, is a little bit like TripAdvisor, but for companies. So I'm sure all of you are very familiar with TripAdvisor. So, you know, you go on, you can rate a hotel you've stayed at, you can rate a restaurant. Um, and essentially, Glassdoor does the same thing for organisations. So I've taken here some figures from um, Starbucks uh, um, rating. So you'll see at the bottom right-hand side, Starbucks at this point in time was rated 3.4 out of 5 based on a total of 788 ratings. And I've taken here some um, some insight from a Starbucks barista in Fall Church, VA, which I guess is Virginia. They were a past employee of Starbucks um, in 2009. They said it was a good first job. The pros, they said, were a fun environment, cool people, um, get to meet, talk to a lot of customers and never bored. However, the cons are tiring, at times stressful, not paid enough for the work they do. And the advice they give to senior management would be to look at paying employees more. So I guess um, the, the internet and the advent of social media is really um, changing the game when it comes to employee engagement. A few years ago, you know, we could keep the lid on what it was really like to work inside a, a, an organisation. And I'm sure many of us have got examples of uh, fantastic looking brands and companies that you think would be great places to work. That when you get inside or when you know someone that works there, the actual reality maybe doesn't match up with the, the brand and the promise of what it could be like to work there. Glassdoor is changing all of that. It's allowing anybody to go online and talk about anonymously what it feels like to work in any particular organisation. So essentially, the cat is out of the bag. Um, people are able to, to talk very openly about um, how it feels to work in particular organisations or any organisation. Now, when I talk to um, groups about Glassdoor, often you'll hear people say, yeah, but, you know, what, a lot, what if lots of disgruntled employees go on and, and have bad things to say about the organisation? And I guess my, my kind of feedback to that is, well, if they're disgruntled, they're not engaged. So, you know, don't you want to do something about that? Also, as with TripAdvisor, the beauty of this is the kind of the, um, the more people that go on and, and rate the company, the more likely you are to believe what they're saying. So if you look up an organisation, there's maybe three people who rated it and they all have negative things to say or really amazingly positive things to say, you might not take it as seriously as if there are hundreds or thousands of people that are rating that organisation. So I think it's worth thinking about Glassdoor and um, probably equivalent sites that we'll see over the coming months and years. Because basically it means that, you know, our reputation is very much at risk if we don't get this right. I think this is a really, really great um, part of the business case if you're trying to sort of get sign up to employee engagement in your organisation or buy into it or you're trying to make the case for budget. I think that pulling out the glass door uh, argument it is really useful to get people to sit up and take notice of why engagement matters. Wouldn't it be great to have lots of people going on and saying what a wonderful place your organisation is to work? Okay, so in terms of um, delivery return on investment, um, obviously running a consultancy um, like People Lab, where we specialise in employee engagement, means we've got lots of really, really great actual return on investment figures. And I'm really happy to share case studies with you if that would be helpful, which help bring a lot of this to life. So over the years that we've been working in this area, um, for example, in, in one organisation, we saw a reduction in call centre att attrition from 41% to 22% in just one year, um, saving over £370,000. Uh, yeah, £370, um, a lot of clients talk to me about 
demonstrating ROI, seen as the kind of holy grail. And, they, you know, quite often it's argued, well, how can we really make sure that we do this? And how do you do it? And actually, is it really possible? And I guess what I'd say is that if you get your objectives spot on at the beginning of a piece of work, so with this first bullet here, um, the reason that we, we work with this organisation on employee engagement was absolutely to bring down attrition. Um, that's quite easy to measure. And, you know, we could say that at least we had made a significant contribution to the change um, that we saw over the, over the course of a year. Um, increased cross sales contribution of over six million. Um, again, um, same argument applies. If you are looking for your engagement program, or engagement activity to target sales or target reduction in absenteeism, then I think that you can at least say that you've contributed significantly to figures like these. And things like attrition, sales, absenteeism are actually fairly straightforward to measure, which means that you can really start to um, demonstrate ROI from engagement activity. Um, we've also run campaigns where we are able to um, show changes in net promoter scores um, and the obvious kind of area are things like increases in survey response rates and actually in survey scores. So these are all real life um, figures taking from clients that we've worked with over the years just to show you that you really can make the link between engagement and return on investment. Okay, so moving on to the next slide then. Um, a few questions for you. You don't have to answer these now, but as I said before, lots of different definitions out there of employee engagement. And really, um, I think it's just useful to consider what your own definition of employee engagement is or what definition your organisation wants to use. And think about why you're focusing on it. So what are your objectives? For what purpose? What is it you're hoping employee engagement will deliver for your organisation? And if you can get really specific on that, it makes evaluation and demonstrating your impact so much easier. So why are you focus on, focusing on it and for what purpose? And therefore, what are your goals and outcomes? Do you want to reduce attrition? Do you need to get your employees to be nicer to customers? Do you want them to act as advocates for the company? If you can figure that out, it makes the link between engagement and um, business performance a lot more straightforward. Okay, so we've talked about what engagement is and we've talked about why it matters. So how do you do it? Um, this is a rough guide to employee engagement. So... I'm just going to signpost you to um, some of the thoughts and ideas on how you actually improve engagement. Okay, and I'm going to start by um, referring back to um, David McLeod and Nita Clark's work on Engage for Success. As I said before, please do go and have a look at the website, the Engage for Success website, because it has some really great resources on there that will help you case studies, tools, tips, etc. Um, but going back to the, the piece of research that David and Nita did for government, I think it was 2009, um, they looked at what great companies did. So what were the enablers for engagement? And they came up with these four key areas, which probably will, will feel fairly familiar to, to quite a few of you. So the first enabler they talk about is this idea of strategic narrative. So having a clear, compelling narrative of where the organisation is going and why. So um, fairly obvious, fairly straightforward, um, not rocket science, however, actually quite difficult to get right. Um, very often go into organisations and um, there'll be lots of confusion about where the organisation's heading or maybe it will be very clear in the mind of the board, but when you drill down through different layers of the organisation, there'll be confusion. And, you know, it's not unusual to see organisations with mission, vision, values, um, brand values, competencies, behaviours. And unsurprisingly, the employees sat there saying, I'm not quite sure what this is all about and how it all knits together. 
So strategic narrative, incredibly important um, pillar of enabling employee engagement. Um, the second bullet line management, absolute no-brainer. Um, just think about a time when you've worked for a great boss and how that made you feel. And then think about a time where you've worked for a poor boss, a bad boss, and how that made you feel. And the famous quote about employees don't leave uh, organisations, they leave managers, is, is very true. Line managers play a really, really critical role in engaging employees. You can have the best job in the world, you can have a great brand you work for, fantastic company, all of that can be in place. But if you work for someone that isn't doing it for you, that isn't engaging you, um, then it can be really, really hard to get engaged. So have a think about your line management. Are they set up to engage people? Have they got the right competencies? Do you offer them um, support and development in this area? Or do you just expect them to get it and get on with it? Third bullet, employee voice. So um, are employees able to make their voice heard? And are they listened to? Um, and they need to feel their voice counts. And the last bullet is integrity. So essentially does say match the do um so how many organizations have have you worked with work for work in where there might be some amazing values up around the walls and you look up at them and think if only i wish this organization behaved in that way because then it really would be a great place to work so really you know have a look at does the say match the do is there a gap and if there is a gap that is something which will absolutely erode engagement. So those are the four Engage for Success enablers, which are all really useful and absolutely spot on. Um, just to give you a slightly different model to think about, um, this is the People Lab engagement elements. And this was really born out of a piece of research that we did back in 2009 um, with a number of um, high performing organisations when it comes to engagement. And essentially, um, very similar really to um, the Engage for Success enablers, but just a slightly different um, take on this. So firstly, we talk about change. So at the top of, of that model really is this um, idea that you need to figure out, first of all, for what purpose? What is the change you're hoping to bring about as a result of the engagement activity? Um, Again, it sounds really obvious, but I've worked with a number of um, clients over the years who aren't really sure why they're engaging their people. They just feel like it's the right thing to do. Um, it's so much easier if you can get really, really clear on that and set some, some smart objectives, some smart goals. In the centre of the model, um, three areas there are, first of all, lead, so very much maps onto um, the engagement for success line management, so um, don't need to go into that. At the heart of the model is this idea of involvement. So I think this kind of goes one step further than employee voice um, to say, actually, we need to do more than just give employees a voice. We need to involve them in the organisation. And the more that we can involve them, the greater their engagement will be. And I've certainly found over the years that where there's been an opportunity to involve people, um, in, in whatever piece of work it is that I, I'm doing, um, I've really got a much greater engagement from involving people wherever possible. Um, sometimes it's not possible for sure, but if there is an opportunity, then let's involve them. Um, some of the pushback that you get, or I, I've had over the years from senior people around involvement, is this idea of managing expectations. That If we involve them, though, they'll want, you know, they'll want, ridiculous things like you know if we involve them in creating a great place to work for example they'll want you know three-day working weeks and swimming pool on the roof and that kind of stuff and my experience has been that that's absolutely not the case I think we often do employees a disservice um, my experience has been that employees absolutely get who they work for and the environment under which they, they work in and they just want the opportunity to um, contribute um, because they can see that, you know, things can be done in a better way. So involvement really key. Um, and then dialogue really um, is about, um, more about employee voice. 
and about creating um, opportunity for conversations. So moving on from one-way or even two-way communication to actually having great conversations and great dialogue in the organisation about um, engagement and what engages people. So taking it out of the ivory tower and taking it away from making assumptions about what engages people to actually having dialogue with employees about what engages them. And at the bottom of the model um, is sustained. So the idea of sustainability. Um, in my experience, again, often um, if you're in quite a, a dark place or, or a bad place when it comes to engagement and it's obvious what needs to be done, that's often not as difficult as as it is when you get there and you've turned things around and you've got high engagement, um, the challenge really is in sustaining it. And um, sustainability really, for, for my for my experience, is about looking at the infrastructure of the organisation. So the way that you recruit people, the way that you train people, the way you onboard people, communicate with them, performance manage them, um, develop them, even exit them. Are those processes set up to help engage people or do they actually sabotage engagement? So a slightly different model for you to consider and, and have a look at in terms of how to, how to engage people. So just going back to this um, transactional versus transformational approach, um, this is something that might sound quite familiar to um, some of you. And this is really, I guess, the transactional approach on a slide. So do a survey, um, action plan, often in a spreadsheet. I don't really get that. Why do we action plan the spreadsheet? And then the results go into a black hole. I'm sure that's not the case for, for, for all of you, but for some organisations, it certainly is. What this tends to give us is dwindling response rate to the survey, a lack of buy-in, increasing cynicism and low trust about um, employee engagement and actually find that no real change is achieved and we have very low return on investment for um, all the effort that goes into the, the survey. And this was certainly um, a place I found myself in um, almost 10 years ago now and I started questioning this approach and thinking surely there must be a better way to approach engagement um, surely there's a better way to do things and I think it absolutely is time for a change but what's it look like um, what can we learn from positive psychology so I'm going to share with you now some sort of hints and tips um, which have really helped uh, me and my clients move from transactional engagement to much more transformational engagement but I'm just going to share with you a little bit of psychology now to set this up OK, so the current paradigm um, which exists throughout is if we work really hard, we'll have more success and we'll be happier and we'll win. So that's kind of how we socialise, uh, sorry, how we um, uh, educate people, how we, we um, approach our work. It kind of runs through uh, all different facets of life, even how we parent. But the formula is scientifically broken. Every time we reach uh, our goal, we have a success, we tend to change the goalposts. So we reach our sales targets, we set slightly higher targets. So uh, essentially, we, we are pushing our happiness over the cognitive horizon. So, you know, if I could just be a little bit richer, a little bit thinner, a little bit whatever it might be, I'll be happy. And you get there and you find actually, maybe in the short term you are, but it's very short lived and then things return to how they were um, fairly quickly. And what we find is actually the opposite is true, that if we can get our brains into a positive state, they perform significantly better than negative neutral stress brains. So what that means is if we focus on creating happy, positive brains, we're more successful. And research has shown that um, we have increases in intelligence, creativity and energy. And in actual fact, this translates into business outcomes. And this is why um, engagement predicts business performance. So essentially, if we can get, um, get to a place where we have happy, positive, engaged people, then we perform a whole lot better. And one of the, um, one of the infamous um, psychologists within positive psychology, Luba Mirsky, found that by doing this, by getting us into a positive state, 
we would uh, witness 31% increase in productivity, um, improved resilience, less burnout, less turnover, um, even increased sales, a um, whole load of um, business outcomes that um, would link to um, getting at us into positive states. Okay, So there's a lot of science out there that backs this up. And this is really what sits behind the nail in the evidence report that I talked about earlier. So I find that most people have now uh, bought into the, um, the argument that employee engagement predicts business performance, but no one's really asked why. So why would that be the case? And this uh, understanding the positive psychology behind this really gives you the answers and helps you understand why this should be the case. So what we find is that the formula is the wrong way around. Actually, if we get people into a happier positive state, or we could say an engaged state, then they are able to work a lot harder, smarter, better, and then they enjoy more success. And there's quite a simple uh, reason as to why this is the case. So when we are in a positive brain state or, or uh, you know, we're, we're feeling better about things, our brain releases dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter. And dopamine not only makes you feel happier, but it also turns on the learning centres in your brain. So this is why we find that if we get people in a more positive state, uh, or we could say a, a, an engaged state, they are just better able to work um, in a much smarter way, which then means that we enjoy more success. So this is the psychology that explains why engagement works. And for those of you sat there thinking, oh, well, you know, this is all very well and good, but, you know, how do we do this? How easy can it be? Um, there is a whole body of evidence and a whole load of research that says you can actually rewire your brain. Um, I'm just going to touch on this. As I said, it is a rough guide today, so I'm not going to go into it in, in, in any detail. Um, but one of the interventions that Lubomirsky talks about is... Um, essentially following this recipe for 21 days so 20 for 21 days um record three gratitudes every day so three things you're grateful for at the end of every day um engage in some journaling so writing diaries capturing thoughts um feelings um capturing your day exercise really important in terms of getting you into a positive um positive brain state uh, meditation also shown to be really important and we're really seeing the, uh, the the rise of mindfulness at work as lots of interventions based around mindfulness at work as people are starting to cotton on to this and random acts of kindness. So by doing these things every day for 21 days they help to train your brain to scan for the positive rather than the negative and that's a really great intervention you can use either personally or you could use it with people you work with and see if you um if you can tell uh, a difference in between when you started it and when you finished it. Okay, so just moving on then. Um, I mentioned that some sort of nearly 10 years ago now, I decided there must be a different way to approach um, engagement. And I came across something called appreciative inquiry, um, which, don't be put off by the title, is actually a really simple tool um, for using positive psychology in the workplace. Um, and it really um, takes takes you around a kind of a five-step cycle. So first of all, it asks you to look at definitions, so what frames our inquiry. So we could be, for example, talking about employee engagement. And then, essentially, you ask questions which take you around these, these four cycles. So first of all, discovery, the best of what is. So what is good about today? Or what's been good about your, your previous experience when it comes to engagement? And then it asks you to dream, so think about what could be, so envisioning the future. And then you take it down from that very expansionist kind of, of what it could be like to more reductionist, what it should be like in the design phase. And then round to destiny, how we get there. Now, I came across this and was quite excited by it because... Until that point, we'd always been looking at the transactional approach of what's not working, what does the survey tell us doesn't work, what are the bottom three things from the survey, let's focus on those, let's try and fix them and then everything will be great. And it wasn't really doing it for me and it wasn't really working for the organisations I was working in at the time. And this got me excited because I thought, 
hang on, if we just ask some different questions about employee engagement and ask some questions about what does work and take a strength-based approach, I wonder if that might have a different outcome. So I changed the model slightly um, and we have a whole toolkit that's based around this. Um, I found that people didn't warm so, so much to the very American kind of appreciative inquiry um, uh, terminology in, in the UK, so we changed it called the Make the Difference Toolkit. And we talked about see the difference, imagine the difference, shape the difference and be the difference. And um, the, the results we had from taking this different strength-based approach were really quite phenomenal. And if you just think back to that return on investment um, slide that I showed you, that really sums up the kind of results we were getting from this approach. Just to bring it to life for you a little bit, um, one of the clients we worked with very early on with this was Everest. And we took this, um, this approach with Everest um, in what was quite a challenging time for them. So quite a number of years ago now, um, but they needed to reduce costs. They had um, lack of trust and some very challenging trading conditions and ultimately low survey participation. And we wanted to work with Everest to transform them into a great place to work. So we use this um, appreciative inquiry, make the difference toolkit with Everest to say, let's not take the bottom three things from the survey. Let's look at what works and focus on that. And we use some viral change there. We involved employees in creating a great place to work. We essentially recruited some champions. We worked with the champions and we ran some workshops, which essentially asked people to talk about what good looks like and what it could be like in 12 months time. And we had some amazing results with Everest in that um, we saw some quick wins happening very quickly and um, people really getting involved um, very quickly to create a great place to work. In terms of if it worked or not, um, I'm really happy to send you out the full Everest case study if you'd like to have a read through that. So please do get in touch and, and it will kind of go into a lot more detail um, in terms of what we actually did and how we did it. But yes, we we um, we saw some great results with Everest. Um, at the time uh, when we started working with Everest, it was 2008 and the credit crunch was just starting to happen. And they were facing some very tough decisions in terms of um, sales forecasts and um, potential redundancies or reducing the working week or reducing pay. And through the engagement approach that, that they implemented there, they actually managed to get 87% of employees to voluntarily sign a consent form to reduce salaries if required, which would have meant a potential 1.2 million um, cost saving. However, what was even more amazing was that um, they never had to, had to implement that, um, that uh, reduction of salaries. Because whilst in 2009 the um, home improvement market was down some, I think it was uh, 25%, Everest saw their sales go up by, I think it was 12%, and they put that down um, in no small part to the employee engagement activity um, that they'd been working on and focusing on. Um, they also saw their survey response rate go from 50% to 94%, um, engagement scores improved across the board, um, they involved employees in contributing towards um, reducing their operating costs and really just the sheer volume of local activity um, was really uh, a great outcome for the focus on engagement in, in Everest. And this is also an example of best practice and um, we did win a couple of awards with this as well. So I just wanted to share that with you as an example of, of how you can take a different approach to engagement take a strength-based approach to engagement and get a very, very different outcome. And by taking the strength-based approach, you can start to move from a transactional box-sticking approach to a much more transformational, a transformational approach to engagement. And as I said, if you want a copy of that case study, please do get in touch and we'll be more than happy to share it with you. Okay, so just to finish off then, um, what we found over the years is that engaged and positive, happy people um, come first. And if you get it right with your people first, the business performance and the business outcomes will follow. And that actually, um, focusing on 
creating great places to work and, and creating a place where people can be happy, engaged and, pos- and positive is good for everybody. It's good for the employees themselves. Um, it's good for customers for sure. It's good for the business because the business enjoys um, some great performance outcomes and it's good for society. So just to finish off then, um, the question, the only question I've really got for you is why wouldn't you take it seriously? And I don't really need to ask all of you that because you're obviously taking it seriously given that you've dialed in today. So thank you very much for that. Um, so just to finish then, um, thank you for um, listening to our webinar today. If you do want to get in touch, then please give me a call there. My number's on the final slide there. Um, or you can send an email to info at peoplelab.co.uk. Um, we'll be very happy to answer any questions you might have. And obviously, if you want the case study, please get in touch and we'll happily send it out to you. And if you do want any more information on a strength-based approach to employee engagement or the toolkit I mentioned, um, really happy to um, send that information on that as well. So thank you very much and um, hopefully look forward to um, speaking to you soon. Thank you very much.